Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation of The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, a London Taxi Films production. I had called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes upon the second morning after Christmas, with the intention of wishing him the compliments of the season. He was lounging upon the sofa in a purple dressing gown, a pipe rack within his reach upon the right and a pair of crumpled morning papers, evidently newly studied, near at hand. Beside the couch was a wooden chair, and on the angle of the back hung a very seedy and disreputable heartfelt hat much the worse for wear and cracked in several places. A lens and a forceps lying upon the seat of the chair suggested that the hat had been suspended in this manner for the purpose of examination. Good day, Holmes. <laughs> ah, you're engaged. Uh, perhaps I interrupt you. Not at all, Watson. Come in, come in. I am glad to have a friend with whom I can discuss my results. The matter is a perfectly trivial one, but there are points in connection with it which are not entirely devoid of interest, and even of instruction. He pointed to the hat. What do you make of that? I suppose that, homely as it looks, this thing has some deadly story linked to it. It is the clue which will guide you in the solution of some mystery and the punishment of some crime. No, no, no crime. Only one of those whimsical little incidents which will happen when you have four million human beings all jostling each other within the space of a few square miles. Amid so dense a swarm of humanity, many a little problem will be presented, which may be striking and bizarre, without being criminal. We have already had experience of such. Yes, so much so that of the last six cases which I've added to my notes, three have been entirely free of any legal crime. Precisely. The Irene Adler papers, the singular case of Miss Mary Sutherland, and the adventure of the man with the twisted lip. I have no doubt that this small matter will fall into the same innocent category. You know Peterson, the commissionaire? Yes. It is to him that this trophy belongs. It is his hat? No, he found it. Its owner is unknown. I beg that you will look upon it as an intellectual problem. First, as to how it came here. It arrived upon Christmas morning, in company with a good fat goose, which is, I have no doubt, roasting at this moment in front of Peterson's fire. The facts are these. About four o'clock on Christmas morning, Peterson was returning from some small jollification, and was making his way homeward down Tottenham Court Road. In front of him he saw, in the gaslight, a tallish man, walking with a slight stagger, and carrying a white goose slung over his shoulder. As he reached the corner of Good Street, a row broke out between this stranger and a group of roughs. One of the latter knocked off the man's hat. He raised his stick to defend himself and, swinging it over his head, smashed the shop window behind him. Peterson had rushed forward to protect the stranger, but the man, shocked at having broken the window and seeing an official-looking person in uniform rushing towards him, dropped his goose, took to his heels, and vanished amid the labyrinth of small streets which lie at the back of Tottenham Court Road. The roughs had also fled, so Peterson was left in possession of the field of battle and also of the spoils of victory in the shape of this battered hat and a most unimpeachable Christmas goose. Which surely he restored to their owner. <laughs> My dear fellow, there lies the problem. It is true that for Mrs. Henry Baker was printed upon a small card which was tied to the bird's left leg, and it is also true that the initials H.B. are legible upon the lining of this hat, but as there are thousands of bakers and hundreds of Henry Bakers in this city of ours, it is not easy to restore lost property to any one of them. What then did Peterson do? He brought round both hat and goose to me on Christmas morning, knowing that even the smallest problems are of interest to me. 
The goose we retained until this morning, when there were signs that, in spite of the slight frost, it would be well that it should be eaten without unnecessary delay. Its finder has carried it off, therefore, to fulfil the ultimate destiny of a goose, while I continue to retain the hat of the gentleman who lost his Christmas dinner. Did he not advertise? No. Then what clue could you have as to his identity? Only as much as we can deduce. From his hat? From his hat. But you're joking. What can you gather from this old battered felt? Here is my lens, you know my methods. What can you gather as to the individuality of the man who has worn this article? I took the tattered object in my hands and turned it over rather ruefully. It was a very ordinary black hat of the usual round shape, hard and much the worse for wear. The lining had been of red silk, but was a good deal discoloured. There was no maker's name, but as Holmes had remarked, the initials HB were scrawled upon one side. It was pierced in the brim for a hat securer, but the elastic was missing. For the rest, it was cracked, exceedingly dusty, and spotted in several places, although there seemed to have been some attempt to hide the discoloured patches by smearing them with ink. I can see nothing. On the contrary, Watson, you can see everything. You fail, however, to reason from what you see. You are too timid in drawing your inferences. Then pray tell me what it is that you can infer from this hat. It is perhaps less suggestive than it might have been. And yet there are a few inferences which are very distinct, and others which represent at least a strong balance of probability. That the man was highly intellectual is, of course, obvious upon the face of it, and also that he was fairly well to do within the last three years, although he has now fallen upon evil days. He had foresight, but has less now than formerly, pointing to a moral retrogression which, when taken with the decline of his fortunes, seems to indicate some evil influence, probably drink at work upon him. This may account also for the obvious fact that his wife has ceased to love him. Ah, oh, my dear Holmes! He has, however, retained some degree of self-respect. He is a man who leads a sedentary life, goes out little, is out of training entirely, is middle-aged, has grizzled hair which he has had cut within the last few days, and which he anoints with lime cream. These are the more patent facts which are to be deduced from his hat. Also, by the way, that it is extremely improbable that he is gas laid on in his house. You are certainly joking, Holmes. Not in the least. Is it possible that even now, when I give you these results, you are unable to see how they are attained? I have no doubt that I am very stupid, but I must confess that I am unable to follow you. For example, how did you deduce that this man was an intellectual? For answer, Holmes clapped the hat upon his head. It came right over the forehead and settled upon the bridge of his nose. It is a question of cubic capacity. A man with so large a brain must have something in it. <sighs> the decline of his fortunes, then. This hat is three years old. These flat brims curled at the edge came in then. It is a hat of the very best quality. Look at the band of ribbed silk and the excellent lining. If this man could afford to buy so expensive a hat three years ago, and has had no hat since, then he has assuredly gone down in the world. Well, that is clear enough, certainly. But how about the foresight and the moral retrogression? The foresight is in the loop and disc of this hat securer. They are never sold upon hats. If this man ordered one, it is a sign of a certain amount of foresight, since he went out of his way to take this precaution against the wind. But, since we see that he has broken the elastic and has not troubled to replace it, it is obvious that he has less foresight now than formerly, which is distinct proof of a weakening nature. On the other hand, he has endeavoured to conceal some of these stains upon the felt by daubing them with ink, which is a sign that he has not entirely lost his self-respect. Your reasoning is certainly plausible. The further points that he is middle-aged, his hair is grizzled, it has been recently cut, and that he uses lime cream are all to be gathered from a close examination of the lower part of the lining. 
The lens discloses a large number of hair ends, clean cut by the scissors of the barber. They all appear to be adhesive, and there is a distinct odour of lime cream. This dust, you observe, is not the gritty grey dust of the street, but the fluffy brown dust of the house, showing that it has been hung up indoors most of the time, while the marks of moisture upon the inside are proof positive that the wearer perspired very freely and could therefore hardly be in the best of training. But his wife, you said she had ceased to love him. This hat has not been brushed for weeks. When I see you, my dear Watson, with a week's accumulation of dust upon your hat, and when your wife allows you to go out in such a state, I shall fear that you also have been unfortunate enough to lose your wife's affection. But he might be a bachelor. Nay, he was bringing home the goose as a peace offering to his wife. Remember the card upon the bird's leg. You have an answer to everything. But how on earth do you deduce that the gas is not laid on in his house? One tallow stain, or even two, might come by chance. But when I see no less than five, there can be little doubt that the individual must be brought into frequent contact with burning tallow. He probably walks upstairs at night with his hat in one hand and a guttering candle in the other. In any case, he never got tallow stains from a gas jet. Are you satisfied? Well, it is very ingenious, but since, as you said just now, there has been no crime committed and no harm done save the loss of a goose, all this seems to be rather a waste of energy. The goose, Mr. Holmes. The goose. The goose. Oh, good God, Peterson, get a hold of yourself. What's this about the goose? Has it returned to life and flapped off through the kitchen window? See here, sir. See what my wife found in its crop. He held out his hand and displayed upon the centre of the palm a brilliantly scintillating blue stone, rather smaller than a bean in size, but of such purity and radiance that it twinkled like an electric point in the dark hollow of his hand. By Jove, Peterson, this is treasure indeed. I suppose you know what you have got. A precious stone. It cuts in the glass as though it were putty. It's more than a precious stone. It is the precious stone. Holmes, not the Countess of Morcar's blue carbuncle. Precisely so. It is absolutely unique, and its value can only be conjectured, but... The reward offered of one thousand pounds is certainly not within a twentieth part of the market price. A thousand pounds? Great Lord of mercy! That is the reward. But I know there are sentimental considerations in the background which would induce the Countess to part with half her fortune, if she could but recover the gem. It was lost, if I remember all right, at the Hotel Cosmopolitan. There's a good account of it here. Hotel Cosmopolitan Jewel Robbery, John Horner, 26 Plumber, was brought up upon the charge of having upon the 22nd instant abstracted from the jewel case of the Countess of Morcar the valuable gem known as the Blue Carbuncle. James Ryder, upper attendant at the hotel, gave his evidence to the effect that he had shown Horner up to the dressing room of the Countess upon the day of the robbery, in order that he might solder the second bar of the grate which was loose. He had remained with Horner some little time, but had finally been called away. On returning he found that Horner had disappeared, and the small Morocco casket in which the Countess was accustomed to keep her jewel was lying empty upon the dressing table. Horner was arrested the same evening, but the stone could not be found, either upon his person or in his rooms. Inspector Bradstreet, B. Division, Evidence, Magistrate, Horner fainted. So much for that. The question for us to solve is the sequence of events leading from a rifled jewel case at one end to the crop of a goose in Tottenham Court Road at the other. You see, Watson, our little deductions have suddenly assumed a much more important and less innocent aspect. Here is the stone. The stone came from the goose, and the goose came from Mr. Henry Baker, the gentleman with the bad hat, and all the other characteristics with which I have bored you. So now we must set ourselves to find this gentleman and ascertain what part he played in this little mystery. To do this, we must try the simplest means first, and these lie undoubtedly 
in an advertisement in all the evening papers. What will you say? Uh, give me a pencil in that slip of paper. Now, found at the corner of Good Street, a goose and a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Baker can have the same by applying at 6.30 this evening at 221B Baker Street. That is clear and concise. Very, but will he see it? He is sure to keep an eye on the paper since, to a poor man, the loss was a heavy one. He was clearly so scared by his mischance in breaking the window and by the approach of Peterson that he thought of nothing but flight, but since then he must have bitterly regretted the impulse which caused him to drop the bird. Then again, the introduction of his name will cause him to see it, for everyone who knows him will direct his attention to it. Here you are, Peterson. Run down to the advertising agency and have this put in the evening papers. In which, sir? Oh, the Times, Globe, Star, St. James, Evening News, Standard Echo, any others that occur to you. Very good, sir. And this stone? Ah, yes, I shall keep the stone, thank you. And I say, Peterson, just buy a goose on your way back and leave it here with me, for we must have one to give to this gentleman in place of the one which your family is now devouring. When the commissioner had gone, Holmes took up the stone and held it against the light. It's a bonny thing. Just see how it glints and sparkles. Of course, it is a nucleus and focus of crime, every good stone is. There have been two murders, a vitriol-throwing, a suicide, and several robberies brought about for the sake of this forty-grain weight of crystallized charcoal. Who would think that so pretty a toy would be a purveyor to the gallows and the prison? I'll lock it up in my strong box and drop a line to the Countess to say that we have it. Do you think that this man Horner is innocent? I cannot tell. Well then, do you imagine that this, this other one, Henry Baker, had anything to do with the matter? It is, I think, more likely that Henry Baker is an absolutely innocent man who had no idea the bird he was carrying was of considerably more value than if it were made of solid gold. That, however, I shall determine by a very simple test, if we have an answer to our advertisement. And you can do nothing until then? Nothing. In that case, I shall continue my professional round. But I shall come back in the evening at the hour you have mentioned, for I should like to see the solution of so tangled a business. Excellent. I dine at seven. There is a pheasant, I believe. By the way, in view of recent occurrences, perhaps I ought to ask Mrs. Hudson to examine its crop. I had been delayed at a case, and it was a little after half past six when I found myself in Baker Street once more. As I approached the house, I saw a tall man in a Scotch bonnet, with a coat which was buttoned up to his chin, waiting outside in the bright semicircle which was thrown from the fanlight. Just as I arrived, the door was opened, and we were shown up together to Holmes's room. Hello, Watson, and this is Mr. Henry Baker, I believe. Pray take this seat by the fire, Mr. Baker. It is a cold night, and I observe that your circulation is more adapted for summer than for winter. Now, is that your hat, Mr. Baker? Yes, sir, that is undoubtedly my hat. He was a large man with rounded shoulders, a massive head, and a broad, intelligent face, sloping down to a pointed beard of grizzled brown. A touch of red in nose and cheeks with a slight tremor of his extended hand recalled Holmes's surmise as to his habits. His rusty black frock coat was buttoned right up in front with the collar turned up, and his lank wrists protruded from his sleeves without a sign of cuff or shirt. We have retained these things for some days because we expected to see an advertisement from you giving your address. I am at a loss to know why you did not advertise. <laughs> Shillings have not been so plentiful with me as they once were. I had no doubt that the gang of roughs who assaulted me had carried off both my hat and the bird. I did not care to spend more money in a hopeless attempt at recovering them. Very naturally. Oh, by the way, about the bird, we were compelled to eat it. To eat it? 
Yes, it would have been of no use to anyone had we not done so, but I presume that this other goose upon the sideboard, which is about the same weight and perfectly fresh, will answer your purpose equally well? Oh, certainly, certainly. Of course, we still have the feathers, legs, crop, and so on of your own bird, if you wish. <laughs> they might be useful to me as relics of my adventure, but beyond that I can hardly see what use the disjecta membra of my late acquaintance are going to be to me. No, sir, I think that, with your permission, I will confine my attentions to the excellent bird which I perceive upon the sideboard. Well then, sir, there is your hat, and there your bird. By the way, would it bore you to tell me where you got the other one from? I am somewhat of a foul fancier, and I have seldom seen a better grown goose. Certainly, sir. There are a few of us who frequent the Alpha Inn near the museum. We are to be found in the museum itself during the day, you understand. This year, our good host... Windygate, by name, instituted a goose club, by which, on consideration of some few pence every week, we were each to receive a bird at Christmas. My pence were duly paid, and the rest is familiar to you. I shall now take my leave. My best wishes to you both for the new year. With a comical pomposity of manner, he bowed solemnly to both of us and strode off upon his way. So much for Mr. Henry Baker. It is quite certain that he knows nothing whatsoever about the matter. Are you hungry, Watson? Um, not particularly. Then I suggest we follow up this clue while it is still hot. It was a bitter night, so we drew on our ulsters and wrapped cravats about our throats. Outside, the stars were shining coldly in a cloudless sky, and the breath of the passers-by blew out into smoke like so many pistol shots. Our footfalls rang out crisply and loudly as we swung through the doctor's quarter, Wimpole Street, Harley Street, and so through to Wigmore Street into Oxford Street. And in a quarter of an hour, we were in Bloomsbury at the Alpha Inn, which is a small public house at the corner of one of the streets which runs down into Holborn. Holmes pushed open the door of the private bar and ordered two glasses of beer from the ruddy-faced white-aproned landlord. Your beer should be excellent if it is as good as your geese. My geese? Yes, I was speaking only half an hour ago to Mr. Henry Baker, who was a member of your goose club. Oh, but you see, sir, them's not our geese. Indeed. Whose then? Well, I got the two dozen from a salesman in Covent Garden. I know some of them. Which was it? Breckenridge is his name. Ah, I don't know him. Well, here's your good health, landlord, and prosperity to your house. Good night. Now for Mr. Breckenridge. Remember, Watson, that though we have so homely a thing as a goose at one end of this chain, we have at the other a man who will certainly get seven years' penal servitude unless we can establish his innocence. It is possible that our inquiry may confirm his guilt, but, in any case, we have a line of investigation which has been missed by the police and which a singular chance has placed in our hands. Let us follow it to the bitter end. Faces to the south, then, and quick march. We passed across Holborn, down Endell Street, and so through a zigzag of slums to Covent Garden Market. One of the largest stalls bore the name of Breckenridge upon it, and the proprietor, a horsey-looking man with a sharp face and trim side-whiskers was helping a boy to put up the shutters. There's our quarry. Good evening, sir. Sold out of geese, I see. Let you have five hundred tomorrow morning. Oh, that won't do. Well, there's some over on the store with the gas flare. Ah, but I was recommended to you. Who by? The landlord of the Alpha. Oh, yes. I sent him a couple of dozen. Fine birds they were, too. Now, where did you get them from? Now then, mister, what are you driving at? Let's have it straight now. It is straight enough. I should like to know who sold you the geese which you supplied to the Alpha. Well then, I shan't tell you. So there. Oh, it is a matter of no importance, but I don't know why you should be so warm over such a trifle. Warm? <laughs> You'd be as warm, maybe, if you were pestered as I am. 
when I pay good money for a good article, there should be an end of the business. But it's where are the geese and who did you sell the geese to and what will you take for the geese? I would think they were the only geese in the world to hear the fuss that's made over them. Well, I have no connection with any other people who have been making inquiries. If you won't tell us, the bet is off, that is all. But I'm always ready to back my opinion on a matter of fowls, and I have a fiver on it that the bird I ate is country bread. Well, then you've lost your fiver, for it's town bread. It's nothing of the kind. I say it is. I, I, I don't believe it. Do you think you know more about fowls than I, who've handled them since I was a nipper? I tell you, all those birds that went to Alpha were town bred. You'll never persuade me to believe that. Will you bet, then? It's merely taking your money, for I know that I am right. But I'll have a sovereign on with you, just to teach you not to be obstinate. The salesman gave Holmes a knowing grin, called for a boy to bring him his books, and then opened one and pointed a greasy finger at a page filled with entries. That's the list of the folk from whom I buy. Well then, here on this page are the country folk. You see this on the other page in red ink? Well, that is a list of my town supplies. Now, look at that third name. Just read it out to me. Mrs. Oakshot, 117, Brixton Road, 249. Quite so. Now, turn that up in the ledger. And who was it it sold to? Sold to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha at 12 shillings. What have you to say now? All right, here's your sovereign. Holmes turned away and stalked off. I followed him round a corner till we were out of sight of the goose cellar. Then he turned to me with a mischievous grin. You can always draw a man like that in with a bet. I dare say that if I had put one hundred pounds down in front of him, he would not have given me such complete information. Well, Watson, we are, I fancy, nearing the end of our quest, and the only point which remains to be determined is whether we should go on to this Mrs. Oakshot tonight or reserve it for tomorrow. You and your geese. I wish you were all at the devil together. Hello, what's all this? We peered around the corner to see Breckingridge arguing with a rat faced little fellow. If you come pestering me any more with your silly talk, I'll set the dog at you. You bring Mrs. Oakshot here and I'll answer her. But what have you got to do with it? Did I buy the geese off you? No, but one of them was mine all the same. Well then, ask Mrs. Oakshot for it. She told me to ask you. Well, you can ask the bloody King of Prussia for all I care. Now off with you. Ha, this may save us a trip to Brixton Road. Come on. We hurried after the little man who'd been chased away by our friend, the goose seller. Holmes caught up to him and tapped him on the shoulder, causing our quarry to spin around like a frightened animal at bay. Who are you, then? What do you want? You will excuse me, but I could not help overhearing the questions which you put to the salesman just now. I might be of some help. You? Who are you? How could you know anything of the matter? My name is Sherlock Holmes. It is my business to know what other people do not. But you can know nothing of this. Excuse me, I know everything of it. You are endeavouring to trace some geese which were sold by Mrs. Oakshot of Brighton Road to a salesman named Breckenridge, by him in turn to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha, and by him to his club, of which Mr. Henry Baker is a member. Oh, sir, you are the very man I have longed to meet. I can hardly explain to you how interested I am in this matter. In that case, we had better discuss it in a cosy room rather than in this wind-swept marketplace. But pray tell me before we go farther who it is that I have the pleasure of assisting. My name? My name is John Robinson. No, no, your real name. It is always awkward doing business with an alias. Well then, my real name is James Ryder. Head attendant at the Hotel Cosmopolitan. I shall soon be able to tell you everything which you would wish to know. We hailed and stepped into a cab, and in half an hour we were back in the sitting room at Baker Street. Nothing had been said during our drive, but the high, thin breathing of our new companion and the claspings and unclaspings of his hand spoke of the nervous tension within him. Here we are. You look cold, Mr. Ryder. Pray take a seat by the fire. Now then, you want to know what became of those geese? Yes, sir. Or rather, I fancy, of that goose. It was one bird, I imagine, in which you were interested, white, with a black bar across the tail. Oh, sir, can you tell me where it went to? 
it came here. Here? Yes, and a most remarkable bird it proved. I don't wonder that you should take an interest in it. It laid an egg after it was dead, the brightest little blue egg that ever was seen. I have it here in my museum. Holmes produced the dazzling jewel, causing Ryder to leap to his feet. The game's up, Ryder. I have almost every link in my hands. How did you hear of this priceless stone? It was Catherine Cusack who told me of it. I see. Her ladyship's waiting maid. It seems to me that there is the making of a very pretty villain in you. You knew that the plumber Horner had been concerned in some such matter before, and that suspicion would rest the more readily upon him. What did you do then? You made some small job in my lady's room, you and your confederate Cusack, and you managed that Horner should be the man sent for. Then, when he had left, you rifled the jewel case, raised the alarm, and had this unfortunate man arrested. Watson, perhaps it is time for the authorities. Oh, sir, for God's sake, have mercy. Think of my father, of my mother. It would break their hearts. I never went wrong before. I never will again. I swear it. I'll swear it on a Bible. Get a hold of yourself, man. It is very well to cringe and crawl now. But you thought little enough of this poor Horner in the dock for a crime of which he knew nothing. I will fly, Mr Holmes. I will leave the country, sir. Then the charge against him will break down. We will talk about that. Now let us hear a true account of the next act. How came the stone into the goose, and how came the goose into the open market? Tell the truth, for there lies your only hope of safety. I will tell you it just as it happened, sir. When Horner had been arrested, it seemed that it would be best for me to get away with the stone at once, for I did not know at what moment the police might not take it into their heads to search me in my room. I went out as if on some commission, and I made for my sister's house. She had married a man named Oakshot, and lived in Brixton Road, where she fattened fowls for the market. All the way there, every man I met seemed to be a policeman or a detective, and for all that it was a cold night, the sweat was pouring down my face before I came to Brixton Road. My sister asked me what was the matter, and why I was so pale. But I told her that I'd been upset by the jewel robbery at the hotel. Then I went into the backyard and smoked a pipe and wondered what it would be best to do. I had a friend who had just been serving his time in Pentonville. I made up my mind to go right on to Kilburn, where he lived, and take him into my confidence. He would show me how to turn the stone into money, but how to get to him in safety. I might at any moment be seized and searched and there would be the stone in my waistcoat pocket. I was leaning against the wall at the time and looking at the geese which were waddling around about my feet. And suddenly an idea came into my head. My sister had told me some weeks before that I might have the pick of her geese for a Christmas present. I would take my goose now and in it I would carry my stone to Kilburn. I caught one of the birds, a big one, white with a barred tail, and prying its bill open, I thrust the stone down its throat as far as my finger could reach. The creature flapped and struggled, and out came my sister to know what was the matter. As I turned to speak to her, the brute broke loose and fluttered off among the others. "'Whatever were you doing with that bird, Jem?' says she. "'Well,' says I, "'you said you'd give me one for Christmas, and I was feeling which was the fattest.' "'Oh,' says she, "'we've set yours aside for you.' Jim's bird, we call it. It's the big white one over yonder. There's 26 of them, which makes one for you and one for us, and two dozen for the market. Thank you, Maggie, says I. But if it's all the same to you, I'd rather have that one I was just handling just now. The other is a good three pound heavier, said she, and we fattened it expressly for you. Never mind. I'll have the other, and I'll take it now, said I. Which is it you want, then? that white one with the barred tail right in the middle of the flock. Oh, very well. Kill it and take it with you. I did what she said, Mr Holmes, and I carried the bird all the way to Kilburn. I told my pal what I had done, 
He laughed until he choked. And we got a knife and opened the goose. My heart turned to water, for there was no sign of the stone. I left the bird, rushed back to my sisters and hurried into the backyard. There was not a bird to be seen there. Where are they all gone, Maggie? I cried. Gone to the dealer's, Jem. But was there another with a barred tail? I asked. The same as the one I chose. Yes, Jem. There were two bar-tailed ones, and I could never tell them apart. Then I ran off as hard as my feet would carry to this man Breckinridge. But he had sold the lot, and not one word would he tell me as to where they had gone. And now I am myself a branded thief, without ever having touched the wealth for which I sold my character. God help me! God help me! He burst into convulsive sobbing with his face buried in his hands. And there was a long silence, broken only by his heavy breathing and by the measured tapping of Sherlock Holmes's fingertips upon the edge of the table. Then my friend rose and threw open the door. Get out. What? Get out. Oh, heaven bless you, sir. No more words. Get out. And no more words were needed. There was a rush, a clatter upon the stairs, the bang of a door, and the crisp rattle of running footfalls from the street. Sherlock Holmes calmly took up his pipe and began filling it. After all, Watson, I am not retained by the police to supply their deficiencies. If Horner were in danger, it would be another thing, but this fellow... No, this fellow will not appear against him, and the case must collapse. I suppose that I am commuting a felony, but it is just possible that I am saving a soul. This fellow will not go wrong again. He is too terribly frightened. Send him to jail now, and you make him a jail bird for life. Besides, it is the season of forgiveness. Chance has put in our way a most singular and whimsical problem, and its solution is its own reward. If you will have the goodness to touch the bell, Doctor, we will begin another investigation in which also a bird will be the chief feature. The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle was written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for the radio by London Taxi Films, and starred Joel Nesbitt as Dr. Watson, Jacob Phillips as both Commissioner Peterson and Mr. Breckenridge, John Grayson as Henry Baker, Gavin Folland as James Ryder, and Jerry Kokich as Sherlock Holmes. The original music selection entitled As It Could Be was composed by Xanthi Kraft and performed by violinist Yvette Kraft. I'm your announcer, Teal Hamish Glenn. Thank you.